This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagarderes streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, Mexico. We're following the very successful 4th IBC U University of Oxford Congress, and I'm very honored to also announce that the IBC University of Oxford webinar series, which is the collaboration between IBC and the Nuffield Department of Surgical Sciences, University of Oxford, continues to grow strength to strength with the aim to provide first-class surgical education globally to improve patient care. The theme of today's 96th IBC University of Oxford Hot Topics in Bariatric Surgery exclusive event is Towards Same Day Sleeve Gastrectomy Surgery, Modifications in Surgical Technique and Post-Operative Care, and will feature experts from the United States, India, Germany, Kuwait, Lebanon, Brazil, Belgium, and Mexico. The IBC University of Oxford webinar partnership would like to thank Zoom Video Communications, Laparoscopic Surge, Bariatric News, and Bariatric Channel for setting up and promoting this regular scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, Stryker, our gold sponsors, Medtronic, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, USGI Medical, Blue Sail Surgical, David Medical, Lexington Medical, our silver sponsors, Apollo Endosurgery, GT Metabolic Solutions, our bronze sponsors, Intuitive, Arthrex, ConMed. The chairs of today's webinar are Professor Pradeep Chaubi from India and Dr. Beat Herbig from Germany. Professor Pradeep Chaubi is Chairman, Max Institute of Minimal Access Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, New Delhi, India, an honorary laparoscopic surgeon to the President of India, also surgeon to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and President of IFSO 2012-2013 also, Padmashri awarded the President of India. Dr. Beat Herberg is Founder and Chief of Obesity Surgery, Klinikum Bielfeld in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany, Founder and Head of Obesity Clinic in Hamburg, Germany from 2012-2021, and Member of the German Guidelines Council for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery, and Board Member of the Bariatric Surgeons of the German Surgical Society. I will now ask Professor Pradeep Chaubi to introduce our esteemed moderators. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, uh, which is going to be very, very interesting. And today, I think we are talking about the sleeve gastrectomy as a daycare procedure and the same day discharge. And we'll see the how it is to be achieved, how what are the efforts needed for it, and what are the outcomes of this. And I'm glad to introduce our uh, moderators. And uh, our moderator first is uh, uh, Professor Jamal. He's the Associated uh, Professor in Kuwait University in Kuwait, and the Chairman of uh, Transplantation uh, at Kuwait University and Consultant Metabolic and Bariatric and Upper GI Surgeon. The uh, next morning, um, moderator is Dr. Allison Barrett from USA, uh, bariatric and general surgeon with uh, Pan State uh, Health and in Pennsylvania in USA. Her areas of practice includes enhanced recovery after surgical surgery protocol, primary and revisional bariatric surgery, robotic surgery, and acute care general surgery. So welcome our moderators and welcome our speakers. Uh, let's move on with the program. And may I request uh, Dr. Harbert, will, he will be introducing our speakers. Hi, I'm Beate Herbig from Germany and a very warm welcome to everyone who is, with, who is watching us. Um, I think we should right jump into this session with the first presentation given by uh, Dr. Anne-Catherine dandry Foss from Brussels. She is a very esteemed consultant general gastrointestinal and bariatric surgeon and head of the surgery and digestive su surgery department at the Delta Hospital in Brussels. Nevertheless, she is also a nutritionist doctor, and we are looking forward to your presentation, Sleeve Gastrectomy Surgery with Low-Pressure Neuroperitoneum. Thank you for this present introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure to join you to discuss this topic. 
I am from Brussels and I work in a private hospital. This presentation represents my own opinions, no commercial interest to be disclosed. The intra-abdominal pressure is traditionally set at a routine pressure of 12, 15 millimeter of mercury, sometimes 20. It depends on uh, your team. Nevertheless, for more than 20 years now, we have been advised not to use a routine abdominal pressure, but to work with the lowest pressure possible, which allows us to do a quality job. We shouldn't standardize our traditional pressure, but we should standardize the fact that we always work with the lowest pressure without reducing the quality of our work. Why were we given this recommendation? Let's get back to basics. First, a remember of physics and after physiology. The Pascal's law, when we insufflate an abdomen, of course, the gas is evenly distributed in the abdomen. Compliance. Compliance is the ratio of volume difference to pressure difference. The higher the pressure, the higher the volume. And as you can see in this graph, there is a direct link between volume and pressure. The compliance varies from an individual to another. So with the same pressure, you won't have the same volume. At one point, you won't have again of comfort, but a higher pressure. Laplace law, if the pressure is higher, you will have a higher radius, but if the sickness is stable or nearby, you will have a higher tension in the abdomen. What is the link between the tension and the physiology of our patients? In this article, they explain that we, as bariatric surgeons, should be aware of everything about physiology. Physiologic effects of pneumoperitoneum include systemic absorption of carbon dioxide and hemodynamic and physiologic alteration in a variety of organs due to increased intra-abdominal pressure. Carbon dioxide absorption across the peritoneum and into the systemic circulation can result in hypercarbia and eventual systemic acidosis. Your anesthesiologist will do what's necessary to avoid those complications by adapting the ventilation. Heart rate and mean arterial blood pressure commonly increase during laparoscopy. The cardiac function is affected by increased intra-abdominal pressure, reverse trendelenburg, positioning, and hypercarbia. hypercarbia. The increased intra-abdominal pressure is the main factor that may account for cardiac depression. Nevertheless, our obese patients seem to have a better adaptation due to baseline higher, higher intra-abdominal pressure. Respiratory mechanism, the respiratory compliance decrease and the airway pressure increase due to the cephalic shift of the diaphragm. Renal function, the urine output is diminished due to the direct pressure on the renal vasculature and the renal cortical blood flow. And you have also a release of certain hormones such as antidiuretic hormone plasma renin activity, and serum aldosterone. Liver function, the transaminous levels after laparoscopic bariatric surgery have been shown to peak at 24 hours postoperatively. The mechanism include direct operative trauma to the liver, the use of general anesthetics, and the reduction of portal venous flow during pneumoperitoneum. So physiology, it has an impact also on venous femoral flow and intracranial pressure. It's therefore very important to work with the lowest possible abdominal pressure. It depends from one article to another, but low pressure is generally defined as a natural pressure between six and 10 millimeters of mercury with a described perfusion pressure in the distal segment of the capillary network of the parietal peritoneum. 
Low intra-abdominal pressure is not an ERAS recommendation, but uh, in 2016, they specified that recommendations are sometimes extrapolated from non-bariatric settings. And we have this article from colorectal surgery. And um, as you can see, low intra-abdominal pressure, they conclude by low intra-abdominal pressure during laparoscopic colorectal surgery is safe improves the postoperative quality of recovery, preserves innate immune homeostasis, and forms a valuable addition to future enhanced recovery after surgery programs. And we have this meta-analysis published this year, and we have in the highlights that low pressure laparoscopy reduce pain um, scores, post-operative nausea and vomiting, and length of stay. Low pressure laparoscopy reduces the risk of mild post-operative complication. Low pressure laparoscopy does not increase the rate of intraoperative complications. So the use of low intraabdominal pressure during laparoscopic surgery is recommended. But we have also this article. Risk. So the name uh, of this article is um, Risk Factors for Readmission After Same Day Discharge Sleeve Gastrectomy, Metabolic and Biatric Surgery Accreditation and Quality Improvement Program Database Analysis. But what they say is that the most common reasons for readmission were nausea, vomiting, fluid electronic or nutritional depression, abdominal pain, 10%, bleeding. So there is a link between um, low pressure and uh, reasons for readmission after same day discharge sleeve gastrectomy. But the real question is, is low intra-abdominal pressure achievable in bariatric surgery? We have this recent article and uh, their key points are that safety, feasibility of low abdominal pressure during sleeve gastrectomy is unknown. Sleeve gastrectomy under low abdominal pressure was feasible in only, I would say only 53% um, of the patients. And they suggest caution for using low pressure during sleeve gastrectomy. As a bariatric team, we started low pressure in 19. To increase the number of patients that could have it, we have think about factors we could improve. So we have factors affecting the pressure related to the patient we cannot improve. So first, of course, the BMI. It should be noted that a normal individual would have an estimated baseline pressure of five millimeter of mercury or less, while an obese patient would have an estimated baseline abdominal pressure of around eight millimeter of mercury or less. But baseline, so baseline pressure varies from one individual to another. And of course, it's impossible to work with a low pressure if the baseline is at eight millimeter of mercury. Preoperative weight loss could have an impact on compliance. Previous laparoscopy, scars, peritoneal dialysis, adherences, pregnancy, the sickness of the abdominal wall. We have also post Procedural related factors, as recommended by ERAS, my anesthesiologist used deep neuromuscular blockade. We have a higher compliance, thanks to that. Before we insert the port, we use a standard pressure of 15. This is for security, of course, but also to perform a press stretching. The position of the patient is also important, the beach chair position. In our team, we have also chosen to use air seal to maintain a stable pressure in the abdomen. And the last point for me, it's very important, it's to deal with my surgeon psychology. So uh, my anesthesiologist is allowed to reduce the pressure without me knowing it. And uh, sometimes I have very big surprises. So I have not a view uh, on the air seal, 
but sometimes it's very low. And if I have not enough space during the surgery, my anesthesiologist is like a remote, a remote control. He's always in the theater and he does what is necessary to have the good pressure for all the team. So we do not standardize a certain value of intra-abdominal pressure, but we do standardize to always use the lowest pressure. We kept track of 69 patients and related factors. We tried to know what was the most important point. We kept track of width of the abdominal wall, see for pubic distance, abdominal uh, girth. And we had um, statistical calculation and the level of pneumoperitoneal was linked to the abdominal width. That is the compliance. And we agreed with the article called low pressure during sleeve gastrectomy, a safety and feasible analysis, because as you can see, it was feasible to perform low pressure, but not for all the patients. So this movie to illustrate. So as you can see here, it's, you have to look at uh, these vessels. So it's 12, but if we go higher at 15, you will have a loss of blood here in the vessel. And you can also have a look here because when it's going down, so now it's eight, and very fastly, we, you will have a refill of the blood and also more blood here, just below um, the, a part of the stomach. So take home message, the pressure value of the pneumoperitoneum, of course, has a physiological impact. Eras pass where we use perioperative surgical stress and have proven to shorter uh, hospitalization. Low pressure is not included in bariatric guidelines. Standardization does not mean that we should apply the same pressure to each patient, but that we should use the lowest possible prof, uh, pressure for each surgery. So to conclude, I think that low pressure intra-abdominal laparoscopy may have an impact when we want to perform a same day sleeve gastrectomy. And I want to thank my team, of course, without whom nothing would be possible. And also I would like to thank you for having listened to me. So I'm here for questions now. Thank you very much, anne Catherine. Uh, that was a very interesting insight into this uh, fascinating problem of how much uh, pressure do we really need. And what I take home is um, mostly uh, the question that we need the, um, the, um, the motivation to do it, the dare to, to reduce um, the pressure. And we need committed anesthetists at our side. And uh, I like your um, your definition of standardization, that it's not a fixed number, but it is a fixed idea of what you will achieve with your patient or for your patient. So thank you. I think we are open for questions. And uh, Professor Chobay, do you have any questions to anne Katerin? Yeah. yeah, sure. I think it was a very nice presentation and a lot of things uh, uh, were very informative. My question is that uh, should we use the low pressure only for the patients who are going to go back on the same day or we should uh, form that habit or the protocol for all the bariatric patients or all the sleep patients which are done, whether they are going on the same day or next day or two days later, use the low pressure. So I think... It's a good idea to use it for every patient, every type of surgeries. So perhaps even for the oldest one, so for very old patients, not for bariatric uh, patients, more variable because some with they have which they have a very compliance, and it's sometimes easy to operate with very low pressure, and we just have to care. 
and um, to have an anesthesiologist in the room because of this, and if you don't have somebody to put a higher pressure, uh, it's something that will complicate your surgery. But I think it's an everyday uh, habit to have, to adopt. Did you have to move from low pressure to high pressure sometime? Yes, because of course. operating difficulties. Yes, of and course. It make the difference that the patient will not be going back today because of the you know variation uh, in low pressure and high pressure, which made it uh, uh, less desirable for the patient to go back on on the same day. So when the pressure is higher, they have more pain in the shoulder. So when it's possible to perform the surgery with a low pressure, and also we use um, opioid-free anesthesia. So we have patients with a very good comfort. So, uh, but if the pressure is higher, uh, they will have shoulder pain. And also if I have to obtain a higher pressure, sometimes it's very often because it's difficult to, to have a good view. And I think it's also because they haven't lost weight before the operation. When they have lost uh, a lot of weight, uh, the compliance is higher. So uh, you will have a better volume with, uh, if they have lost a lot of weight. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Barrett, oh, you, you would like to ask some question, please? Yes, thank you so much for your for your talk. That was wonderful. I had a question about the protocol you talked about pre-stretching, where you're starting at a higher insufflation pressure at the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how long you pre-stretch before you drop the pressure? So um, I keep a high pressure during um, when I put the port. And when the ports are put, it's possible to go down. But at the beginning, I want to have 15 uh, at least of, uh, of pressure. Otherwise, uh, when you try to put the port inside the abdomen, you have a depression and it can be dangerous for the liver, for example. So this is one of the reasons is security, but also it is said that if you have a press stretching, uh, you you have a higher compliance. Thank you. I had one other question regarding the bleeding rate. You said that with a lower pressure, you're noticing more bleeding from staple lines. Are you doing anything differently during the operations to try to mitigate that or control the bleeding? It's a very, very good question because I don't understand why um, in studies they have a higher level of blood complication after the surgery. Um, my feeling is as you see what is bleeding during the surgery, you can deal with that. So I prefer to see what is bleeding during the surgery. So I put uh, what is necessary a stitch or, or another thing, but um, um, that's true. You must be you. You must know that you will have more blood uh, in the field, and uh, you have to be used to that because it's not so clean as usual. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. I think Professor Jamal is not there, so I would like to introduce the next speaker. Mr. Professor Jamal is. Not with us at the moment, isn't it, Gloria? Yeah. So I would uh, like to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Hassan Pawal from uh, Lebanon. Uh, he's the past president, Pan Arab Society for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery, 2019 to 2022. Uh, president elect, uh, if so, Lebanese uh, chapter. Assistant Professor of Surgery, Barrett uh, Arab University, and the Chair of Bariatric and Metabolic Unit, uh, Macast General Hospital. Firstly, gastrectomy in the world under regional anesthesia done by him. Wow, that's very impressive. Uh, Dr. Fawal, please. He will be talking about uh, the uh, uh, sleeve anesthesia a uh, sleeve surgery with regional anesthesia. Professor Fawal, very interesting topic and subject. 
Thank you, Professor Shabi, for the uh, introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Let's share. Me. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. While he's loading, there was one question online from Dr. Himpens regarding how important is the insufflation system regarding low pressure pneumoperitoneum, air seal versus traditional. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I use, we use air seal because we have a stable pressure. So if you use air seal as the pressure is stable, you should put, um, you, you shouldn't take the same uh, pressure than for an usual uh, insufflator. So um, the reason why we use air seal is for the stability. And for example, if you have to put a drain, you don't lose uh, the pressure and uh, it's uh, easier, it's more clean. And uh, the other reason is for virus, virus contamination. So you, have, you don't have in the operating room uh, the same loss of gas. But I think the next presentation is ready. So thank you. We can see it. Thank you. So um, uh, we know that <clears throat> ambulatory metabolic and baritic surgery um, is gaining popularity in the last few years, especially with the uh, pressure we're having from insurance companies covering bodies to uh, decrease the cost of, of bariatric surgery. However, correlating patient outcomes with the length of stay is an important consideration in, in uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery. And does uh, paravertebral block provide a safe strategy for that? We'll try to answer in the uh, coming few slides. First, um, uh, we should know that uh, there is a lot of data showing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. We can yeah. hear you. Very good. Thank you. So uh, when we look at the data, this is a uh, this was published by Adrahman Nameri in Sword in November 2020 on 400,000 patients um, from the MSA Equip. Uh, so uh, patients undergoing sleeve or rheumatic bypass can be discharged safely on the day of their procedure without increasing the incidence of mortality, reoperation, or admission. And we know that MSA Equip accredited um, the uh, ambulatory surgical center to do um, ambulatory metabolic and bariatric surgery for low acuity cases. However, uh, Peter Billing published in SORD in July 2017 his study that showed that even high acuity cases can be done without increase of mortality or morbidity. So to start with, uh, ambulatory metabolic and bariatric surgery may be safe uh, and we'll uh, see how we can um, make it more safer. Uh, this is our duty in the coming, uh, I believe, few years. So uh, for those who don't know what, what we do as a paravertebral bl uh, block, I will give a small introduction. It consists of injecting the anesthetic material around the spinal nerve. So this will block the sensitive motor and sympathetic fibers uh, of the nerves and um, it can be done cervical, thoracic, lumbosacral, and it can be done unilateral or bi bilateral. We started to do uh, block anesthesia at our Department of Surgery in the year 1995. In the year 2000, we did our first laparoscopic cholecystectomy under block. In the year 2010, we did the first lap sleeve under block. And in the year 2016, we did our first one anastomosis gastric bypass under block. I will run um, a short video just to show you the technique of a block and a sleeve. You can see here the anesthesiologist localizing the nerves. Uh, we use either, either nerve stimulators, you can see here the contraction of the muscle, or we can use ultrasound, whatever you want, you can uh, use both. And then we inject the um, uh, anesthetic material into the paravertebral space. Then the patient is positioned as, um, uh, as usual. 
we start, uh, and this is good uh, from the previous presentation, as I mentioned, we start with low uh, pneumoperitoneum uh, because uh, rapid increase of the tension on the peritoneum will cause severe pain and left shoulder pain. So we start by three or five millimeters. And then when we increase it gradually till we have a good space inside. You can see the patient doesn't feel any pain. We did here the, put here the barrest needle. And you can see here the excellent space we have inside. So I get a lot of questions that I may have not a good space while using the paraverterial block. You can see I'm, uh, I'm working um, um, very comfortably. And this is a dissection of the short gastric vessels. Here is a difficult part where we put our oral tube inside. We do exactly what we do in general anesthesia. So um, we put the oral tube and we um, did our seat over the 36 French oral tube. So I'll skip this. Here we start with our transaction, as you can see. Patient don't feel any pain during the transaction. This is the last tapering. We did, you can see the patient is, will go, patient at the end of the procedure. And then you can see the patient walking from the operating table immediately after surgery. Okay. Now we published our data in obesity surgery two years ago on 48 patients comparing general anesthesia versus paravertebral block and the outcome in terms of mortality, morbidity, and access weight loss was the same. The advantage we, we got from um, uh, paravertebral block is patients don't need any analgesia in the first uh, 48 hours. Uh, and more satisfaction. So I'm not saying here that um, uh, paravertebral block is superior to GA, but it is another way to do it, especially for the um, uh, co comorbid patients that we have uh, in the bariatric community. Um, another study by uh, our uh, Dr. Sarhan on uh, 100 cases showing also a great satisfaction rate and similar mortality and morbidity for the general anesthesia group. So why I think block anesthesia may be good for the outpatient sleeve. First, we have um, a lot of studies showing that we have a good hemodynamic stability and spontaneous ventilation throughout the procedure. We have less post-operative nausea and vomiting because the patient did not receive any general anesthetic. We have better, better pain relief, less thrombotic events, and shorter hospital stay and of course, greater uh, patient satisfaction and all of these uh, were published in um, several studies. Now, would paravertebral block help in our patient sleeve? I don't really know, I cannot answer that. Um, because you know, our concerns in ambulatory metabolic and bariatric surgery is um, uh, our bleeding, pain control and respiratory problems. Paravertebral block will help and making our patients more comfortable in terms of pain control and uh, uh, and uh, better uh, respiratory uh, res uh, reserve. But as far as bleeding concern, no, I think that PVB and GA, both of these uh, methods, uh, patients should be monitored through smart tools that give us a, a healthcare provider and access to the vital signs the first 24 hours. Otherwise, we'll put our patients at risk. So to conclude, um, uh, ambulatory metabolic and bariatric surgery may be safe, but it needs a dedicated team that follow our patients, especially in the first 24 hours. Paravertebral block may, may be helpful in AMB, especially in terms of pain control and respiratory discomfort. However, bleeding uh, problems will be the same concern in uh, AMB, uh, uh, general anesthesia or paravertebral block. I believe that for us as surgeons, safety should come first. 
um, we should resist the pressure we're having from insurance companies and covering body. I know that there was some conflict um, uh, like two or three months uh, ago in the States for insurance company um, uh, putting a pressure to, to do outpatient sleep gastrectomy, but I think we should resist that. We cannot consider it till now the standard of care. We'll work for uh, more safety and then we, bariatric community, will decide whether we will do it as a standard or not. Thank you very much. Sure, Adam. Dr. Javi, you're muted. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's a very interesting presentation, a good technique. Uh, will you consider this technique for all the cases or you have uh, some selection that you will be operating only uh, on those patients? Well, this technique is not easily reproducible, Professor Chobi. Really, it needs a, um, a super expert anesthesiologist in doing the block. So uh, when we started to do it, like uh, 15 years ago, it took us like one hour before the surgery to be prepared to do the anesthesia, uh, the the procedure. I mean, so not all surgeons will uh, will wait for uh, for one hour uh, and tolerate the work of the anesthesiologist. You know, we we want everything very fast. But with time, the average um, uh, time needed for block anesthesia is like 15 to 20 minutes, so it is acceptable. So I think yes, we can do it but it needs um, a lot of work from the uh, anesthesiology perspective. What are, what are the limitations for patient considerations like BMI or weight or uh, age or comorbidities? What would you consider? Uh, thank you, Dr. Herbig. Well, actually, we did it for patients with BMI of 65 and 70. And uh, I have the video, but I did not put it for the sake of time. And uh, we did it for these super comorbid patients. And actually, we started to do that, especially for patients who cannot tolerate general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So there is, I believe there is no limitation for doing it under parabetibular block. But we need more work uh, to see and to make sure that the uh, outcome will be good for these comorbid patients. Thank you for your lecture. I was wondering about what else is going on at the anesthesia end. What other medications are they giving as part of this protocol? Are they giving sedation or opioids or anything else besides the regional block? Alison, they tried not to give anything during the surgery because we need the patient to be fully awake. Uh, whenever you give anything, patient will start to, to move and this is uh, this will turn the surgery very difficult to, to achieve. So we try our best not to do uh, give anything. Sometimes they give a small shots of Dormicon the, pa the patient is agitated, especially with the tube inside. Otherwise, we try not to give any uh, anesthetic medication. And I'm sure uh, you are prepared to con uh, for uh, moving on to GA for some other reason. This doesn't work. I'm sure everything everybody is prepared to uh, uh, give general anesthesia. Definitely, Professor Chobi. Actually, we, we consent the patient that this is a mode of an anesthesia that we may convert to general anesthesia. This is number one. And number two, we have one conversion. Patient was in severe pain and the first few cases we did. So we convert one patient to general anesthesia. Oh my. Dr. Abag, you are mute. Sorry. What do yeah. you call what do you consider as a low acuity case in bariatric surgery? Well, this is uh, the study by, uh, I, mean, I, I did not uh, remember, I mean, as I recall from the study of Peter, uh, they said BMI between uh, below 50. They said patients without any, um, any uh, as a advanced uh, uh, score. So I don't recall the detail, but uh, this was the study by Peter Billing. Uh, this is what I recall, BMI below 50, uh, age below 65 and a low as a score. Good. Alison, will you uh, introduce the next speaker? Sure. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much for that lecture. We're gonna move on now to Professor Marcelo Luriaro from Brazil. Uh, he has a PhD in surgical sciences from the University of Sao Paulo and is a member of the Brazilian Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery. Uh, we're pleased to have the professor present a topic called needleoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, pushing the boundaries of standard technique. Thank you, professor. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you see my, my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. So let's move on. Uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. You're going to talk about uh, the mini laparoscopy used for uh, pediatric surgery. Uh, this is not something new, but uh, uh, yeah, we have published this uh, this case report some years ago, and now there is uh, interest on that uh, on that technique. Uh, my disclosures are: I'm keeping a leader for David Medical, and I'm owner of a surgical training center here in the south of Brazil. So what's about the, the concept? The mini laparoscopy uh, is what we call the minimal invasive laparoscopy or mini lap. It's a surgical technique that it's, it's around for the last 20, more than 20 years, it involves smaller and thinner instruments and smaller incisions uh, than the, the typical or the traditional laparoscopic surgery. There are potential benefits uh, for this kind of technique and they are, they're going to be discussed in the, during the presentation. The, so the first guys that tried to do the mini laparoscopy or tried to, uh, to put this technique and, and, and um, as a standard of care was Peter Go and Michel Guignet. And that was uh, pretty much uh, an essay to start doing this kind of things. But at the beginning, the optic was very fragile. So they use a optic of three millimeters. So they used to break very often and the instruments were not adequate. And some years after, that was in the late, late 1990s. And, and some years after uh, here in, in the country, in Brazil, especially in the Northeast of the country, a surgeon called Gustavo Carvalho started doing this in a, a little bit different way. And he started doing the lab calls with mini instruments as a standard of care for this unit, for his unit and with a 10 millimeter scope, normal scope, and tying the, the, the cystic duct. So he, he developed a technique of clipless laparoscopic cholestectomy, and he published this many times. And th this began, uh, this was shown to be very, uh, very safe procedure. And that was the standard of care for him, and then start to be a standard of care for a lot of surgeons here in, in, in the country. If we ask, like a lot of uh, us are doing nowadays, ask uh, the GPT for mini laparoscopy, we're gonna have this uh, concept and a lot of potential benefits. So that, that that's the question here. We are not talking about something completely different. It's, it's completely, it's almost the, the same technique that we are using with the standard laparoscopy, but with thinner instruments. And from that, we can have a lot of, a lot of potential benefits. So the first one is reducing scaring. Of course, uh, if you're using uh, smaller uh, incisions and thinner instruments, you're gonna have a much better a much better, better outcome on cosmosis for the for the patient. Of course, this is not a central question for uh, a bariatric patient, and that's why also we haven't done many cases because this is not a demand for this kind of patient. But anyway, this is much better in terms of uh, of skin scaring uh, than the the normal laparoscopy. And we can see here. Uh, when we do the mini laparoscopy for, for lab calls, for example, there's almost no scars, except the one in the umbilicus. This is another uh, article that our team has published about the injury in the abdominal wall. And we know that the patients, the abdominal wall, uh, or the pain provoked by the abdominal wall lesion, they are not uh, depending on the surface, but much more on the volume. So uh, it's very uh, easy to understand that the higher the volume of uh, the trocar, the higher the pain the patients will feel uh, in their abdominal wall. So if you put the smaller instruments, different from, for example, from the, from the robotic that we use uh, larger instruments, huh? uh, then we're gonna have a much less pain uh, in the abdominal wall. There is a potential risk uh, lower risk of infection too, because we are working with uh, 
again, with thinner instruments, with smaller incisions, so there's less exposition of the wound to the, to the air of the operating room. Uh, this is in, uh, especially important when we use this technique for the extra peritoneal spaces. For example, the preperitoneal space when uh, we do a TEP procedure for hernia repair or a, a heteroperitoneal uh, surgery when we perform a lumbar sympathectomy, it's a surgery that we do a lot here in, in, in the country. So uh, for this kind of small space surgeries, it's very important to have a thinner, thinner instrument because they do not cover too much the view of the camera. And of course, there is also a reduced risk um, regarding hernias. Uh, and we are seeing with the robotic, for example, uh, a um, augmentation in a, a, a bigger number of uh, uh, earnings because of the trockers that the, we do not close them. So we, we have uh, some some of this uh, kind of publications uh, regarding the uh, earnings trockers. And with the mini laparoscopy, uh, you have only to to close the 10 millimeter port because the other parts they are virtually no incision or no damage to the to the muscular layers. There is a potential uh, better control of the vessels too, because we are talking about uh, more controlled instruments. Yeah, this thinner instruments permit allows us to, to be more delicate with the tissues. So this is, again, this is something only potential. And uh, the mini laparoscopy is being a better surgery after having better instruments. So we have a lots of good companies with very good instruments today. Uh, in the beginning, it was not like that. And those instruments are very precise. So we can do whatever we want with the mini laparoscopy, the same thing that we used to do with the five millimeter instruments in the test. So this is just to show the cross stores set of instruments that we can buy like uh, for $20,000 and you have a box of entire setting of very, very high quality uh, instruments to do whatever you want in, in laparoscopy. We've been publishing this, uh, uh, this mini laparoscopy for the last 15 years uh, in the Brazilian literature, South American and in, in the world literature. Uh, so again, this is this is our standard of care for a TEP procedure for the hernia repair, uh, where we can use this instrument and having a better visualization of all the field. This is a hernia in a, in a female patient. And this allows us to, to be fast, as fast as uh, in, in the normal laparoscopy and more precise. This is a lumbar sympathectomy in the retroperitoneal space that we've been using to control uh, uh, plantar aperidrosis. This is a very delicate surgery. We have to, to dissect it from the vena cava. So uh, with the mini laparoscopy, we are very uh, confident and uh, the results are quite better than the normal laparoscopy. This is just to show that how, how precise can we be in a very dangerous place. Uh, this is again, our standard of care. This is for this is what we have uh, doing uh, for, for uh, reflex, uh, fund applications for reflex with mini laparoscopy. We have learned how to do it with uh, for a, uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. So again, it's nothing different from the standard technique but smaller instruments, thinner instruments give potential better results. And this is uh, uh, just a three We will start um, by showing the minute. standard position of the trochus. Movie to show. This is usually begin by 12 this minutes. This is Port at the umbilicus. The ports are in the same position. The standard is All leave. three millimeter trochus inserted under vision. We use a 12 millimeter port for 12 millimeter port in the port in the navel for a, a five millimeter axis or harmonic device. For the camera and five millimeter, a one five millimeter for the uh, for the harmonic. Uh, started by dissecting the greater curve toward the angle of S. We use here three three parts of two millimeters. Using a three millimeter instrument allows tissue handling and maneuver 
to be achieved as good as other instruments. A 5 mm 30 degree scope was used to allow the insertion of a stapler device from the umbilical port. So the stapler this device can facilitate stapling from the single position trocker. Stapling device moves to the 12 mm port in the navel, and then we use a 5 mm scope. This is the only tip that we use that's different from a standard slip gastrectomy. The other things is Absolutely the same. Of course, we have to, to have this uh, angle of staplers to be able to, to do a, a good sleeve astrectomy, a perfect one. Specimen removed under direct vision from the umbilical port. Reinforcement of the line was done by using three millimeter instrument. We reinforced just the, the last uh, uh, staple line or the last and the, and the other one. And then the other uh, hemostasis done by clips or by- Any further bleeding. bleeding was controlled by using a clip or an energy device. The 12 millimeter port was closed by using the transfacial needle technique. Following surgery, Cosmotic scars were clearly illustrated and achieved. So this is a hysteric result at the end of uh, first post-operative mouth. So the conclusion is that uh, it's the same surgery, but this instrument is smaller and the incisions are the smaller too. So uh, for selected cases, I mean, especially for in the beginning, I think that uh, the patient should be not a big patient, a patient until 40, 43 of BMI maximum. Potential, there are potential benefits, uh, potential barrier immediate uh, outcome, cosmosis for sure, lower risk of awareness for sure. And the numbers for the, uh, achieving the learning curve, uh, they are quite small. And this is just our training center in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Chalby. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's so interesting. Just, just going back on time, I think, you know, 96, uh, in, uh, we did the microlaparoscopy uh, workshop in Singapore, and uh, Michelle and myself, we did uh, the microlaparoscopic workshop in 2000 in World Congress in Singapore. So uh, how the things fly. At that time, there were the fibroscopes, which were easily breaking, and it was auto suture which was making it. And gradually it became more popular with three millimeter instruments uh, made by all the companies uh, and which made it sturdy. Uh, my question is that, is there any difference between three millimeter and five millimeter instruments uh, as far as the pain is concerned, as far as the herniation is concerned? Do you think there is a difference because we we by and large we concluded that three and five millimeter are same. There's a lot of difference between five, seven, and ten. <clears throat> is your feeling? Yeah, I can tell you that for lab calls, there is a there there is a measurable uh, difference. We can measure it. Okay, measurable difference. But for sleeve gastrectomy, something new. I I I don't think that for uh, bariatric surgery. We have uh, the interest of the patient so far to being operated with the thinner instruments, but for lab calls for sure, and for the other surgeries that we've been doing for sure too. So uh, if we are discussing here, uh, how can we improve slightly the, the results? Maybe this is one direction, but I don't have the, the, the data to tell you because I, I have just made three of them. 
this is not a serious a case series. Uh, we have a lot of other surgeries in the other situations, but I think there is a way. There, there is a direction here that can improve slightly the results. But for the other for the other kind of surgeries, for lab calls, for hernias, and for lumbar sympathectomies, for sure we can Good. we can see this. The patients have a much lower, not much lower. This is a slight difference, but it's uh, it can be measured. Dr. Lureiro, it's fascinating to see what you have achieved. Um, I think of the mean BMI uh, for bariatric patients in Germany being 50. So uh, we are a little bit <laughs> envy when we see um, your, your technique. Um, are you introducing your residents into this technique uh, early on? Or at which stage do they learn to handle these small instruments? This is a very good question because uh, when we talk about mini laparoscopy, we're talking about the same standard. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to change them. I, I've been involved in with education, uh, especially, uh, I mean, not only for, for residents for the last 20 years. So we studied this and we understand that uh, if you propose something that's not so different from, from the standard of care for the laparoscopy, that is triangulation, um, it's the same kind of instruments, the same design of instrument, they will get it very fast. So there's no big deal to learn how to use mini laparoscopy. Let's go back a little bit on time and, and understand that mini laparoscopy was proposed more or less a little bit earlier than uh, the notes uh, time, the notes and the single port time. Notes and single port, we cannot compare the acquisition of abilities if uh, with mini laparoscopy, it's 10,000 times easier to make a, a gallbladder with mini than to do with the um, single port or uh, nodes. So that was the, the contest of, the, of the, the, the appearance of the mini laparoscopy. So uh, being very objective to you, it's not difficult. You can do, I don't know, 10 lab calls with the standard instruments, and then you can move for mini laparoscopy with no problem. I have another question concerning the sleeve gastrectomy. I mean, you um, patients um, report most pain at the site of retrieving the, the stomach. Um, so what is the real benefit for these patients if the other port sites are not 10 millimeters, but three millimeters? Is it most the hernia question or um, do you see any difference in pain control? I cannot tell you the difference among only three patients. So uh, that's why I think we have to study this better. Uh, there is a potential benefit, but it's not, again, it's not there. There is no data about this. But I, I think there will be slightly different, slightly differences between a standard laparoscopy and mini, mini laparoscopy, especially if we consider what happened with the other techniques. But... Again, so patients, the, the bariatric patients, the obese patients, they're not so demand uh, regarding the cosmesis. So if you explain to this patient that, uh, yeah, he can have a, a little bit of a, a better result using a smaller instrument, maybe he's going to, they're they going to be okay with the technique. But uh, let's put in another contest. Uh, we are trying to convince patients to do uh, robotic sleeve gastrectomies. What's the benefit? So I think it's going to be easier to convince the patients to do mini laparoscopy than a robotic, for example, for a standard standard sleeve for a 40 BMI patient. So I, I think you should always try to you know to to con to contextualize this. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and what size of telescope uh, wide diameter which you are using? Three millimeter telescope. Use Five or ten. Right. You can use a ten millimeter in the beginning, and then you you uh, change it to a five millimeter. Remember that you're going to use a twelve millimeter in the umbilicals and the right hand of the surgeon. You have to use a, a five millimeter, especially to dissect with the harmonic scalpel, for example. So uh, you, you just have to change from a ten millimeter or a five millimeter from the beginning. So you change the scope from ten to five when you start stapling it, or you use it from the beginning, a five millimeter scope. Okay. All right. 
Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. We now move on to our next speaker, uh, Professor Richard Peterson from USA, and he will be talking about the post safe uh, post-operative care. Uh, Professor Peterson is the Chief of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at University of Texas, uh, USA, past president of the Texas State Chapter of ASMBS, and recently elected to be the Secretary of the Treasurer position of ASMBS after serving four years on the Executive Council, quite impressive. A chair and question writing committee for focus practice uh, designation exam in metabolic and bariatric surgery. He's on the social media editor for surgery for obesity and related diseases, as well as the surgical editor of the Bariatric Times. It's a very impressive um, CV and uh, may I request Professor Richard Peterson to make his presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And uh, I will uh, get this up and running. And how does that look? Is that up? Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today. And uh, uh, when Harris uh, asked me to talk about the considerations uh, for the same day of sleep gastrectomy post-operative care, um, I, I wanted to clarify, I said, you really just want just the post-op stuff. So um, I was thankful to actually go in and, and take a look at that. Obviously, there'll be some pre-operative considerations we'll look at. Um, these are my disclosures. I do proctoring for uh, Teleflex and Standard Bariatrics. <coughs> um, so uh, considerations, I think we need to look at patient selection and pre-op protocols, and clearly we're gonna talk about our post-op protocols. That's gonna be the focus of my talk today, but I don't think that we can look at that specifically without touching a little bit on the other uh, items. Uh, not only did I you know, take a look at uh, practices around uh, our area and other practices I know doing same-day sleeve gastrectomies, but also look, there was an article very recently published in SWORD um, about making lemonade with lemons, a multi-center effort to improve outpatient sleep gastrectomy. And I think a lot of surgeons had to move towards this because of the pandemic. So when we, when we look at that, that's one of the benefits. Um, it kind of made us get out of our comfort zone. Um, so with respect to patient uh, consideration, and uh, Dr. Herberg actually had asked this, uh, what do we consider low-risk patients? And I'll, I'll tell you the study itself that I'll kind of refer to a bit uh, BMI less than 60, age was 18 to 65, and they looked at their comorbidities, which I'll put. Uh, the little uh, area I have on the right upper part of the screen, that's actually taken from our MBSA QIP uh, uh, standards across the U.S., and when we look at a center that's going to be doing low acuity uh, bariatric surgery, this is the criteria that we uh, focus on, age less than 18, uh, or greater than 18 or less than 65, with males BMI less than 55 and females BMI less than 60. And of course, we don't want any organ failure uh, patients. So, um, but if you look at the study uh, specifically published in 2023, uh, what they found when they have the outpatient versus inpatient, and I'll tell you what I really like about this study is they, they speak in surgeon. In other words, outpatient really means they went home the same day and inpatient means they stayed overnight. Now, Insurances may say that's observation, but we all know they're inpatient. They're in they're in the house. So um, so they looked at the two different groups. Um, so the age they were definitely a little younger. Um, their BMI uh, statistically was a little lower, although it's mostly if you see here it's a range versus an actual number. And patients who had sleep apnea were much more likely to need to be inpatient versus an outpatient um, procedure. The considerations on you know, pre-op protocols that will actually apply to the post-operative would be something like ERAS protocols, those things that help us uh, get from the beginning to the end. Uh, and those include carbohydrate loading, minimizing intraoperative fluids, multimodal pain control with limited to no narcotics, uh, post-operative nausea control, and plus or minus regional anesthesia. We had a really nice talk about that today as well. Um, and really when they looked at it in the study, uh, there, those patients who went home same day versus those who uh, had to stay as an inpatient really had no difference in postoperative seven-day 
um, emergency visits versus 30 days. So if you look at that, there's really no statistical significance across the groups. And some other things, again, these are sort of in the pre-op is patient consent. Um, does the patient actually consent to going home the same day? In, in this era, it's still a new thing. So we really have to ask the patient, are you okay with that? Um, they need to have a support system at home. It can't just be, uh, you know, these are bigger surgeries. We need to uh, prepare them for that. Um, and then is their location or, or where they live, is it close to the surgeon or the facility? And again, that's all part of the pre-op planning, but those are really important aspects to have uh, in the after portion. So looking specifically at those considerations for patients post-operatively, um, the concerns we have are bleeding, um, PO tolerance, nausea and pain control, as well as their ambulation. So we'll kind of go into each of these specifically. So one of the things that uh, programs and the study, as well as uh, other programs um, that I'm familiar with, um, they do hemoglobin checks within in the recovery room. And so they're doing it between one to two hours postoperatively. Um, each group has a little bit different threshold. Uh, specifically in this study, they were determined okay for discharge to home if their hemoglobin had only dropped less than uh, 1.5 grams per deciliter. Um, and they didn't actually specify in the study whether they did an actual preoperative like day of, which I think would probably be the most accurate way to know if there was a change versus one that was done, say, two weeks before surgery. Um, they looked at heart rates less than 100 and systolic blood pressures greater than 90. And there were some programs uh, that early in the process consider leaving a JP drain to be re removed on post-op day one, which has a plus and minus. Um, one is that it would get them back to the office the next day to have it removed. Um, and so they can be visualized um, and also a window. But again, so many of us have gone away from uh, just drains in general um, when not necessary. And then with respect to the PO tolerance and nausea, um, so there, this particular study required that they were tolerating at least five ounces of fluid before they were leaving, and they wanted three ounces of that in one hour. Um, and again, a lot of other programs looking at six to eight ounces of fluid before being discharged. Um, they're looking again about the nausea. Um, some studies and some uh, folks are using appropriate to amend preoperatively. Um, limiting their narcotics. And again, as I mentioned, uh, on the ERAS type of things, uh, carbohydrate loading preoperatively. Uh, considerations for afterwards, the ambulation and pain. Most of these folks are staying in a recovery room for about four to six hours postoperatively. Uh, they have to be able to ambulate well before they're allowed to go home and also have to be able to void. Um, but other considerations are if they're going to fail, if they fail their PACU discharge, the facility doing outpatient sleeves has to be able to observe the patient overnight. So they have to have that capability, or they have to be able to transfer that patient to a hospital that has an inpatient facility. So uh, those are other considerations that need to be taken into. Um, the other things that, that are done, um, and in the study process as well, in the study that uh, I highlighted, they did a phone call to the patient on postoperative day number one. Uh, they asked them these questions. They asked them about their heart rate. Uh, a lot of patients already have smart and technology at home, uh, whether it be a watch, a Fitbit, for example, or blood pressure cuffs that actually have that information. But uh, additionally, if they don't have that, then they were taught uh, and their family members were taught how to teach them to do that, uh, to get that information. Um, clearly, they were able to ask about pain and nausea, what that was like and how well they were tolerating their fluid, what was their fluid intake uh, since surgery, and how voiding was. Uh, a lot of uh, other things uh, to consider would be having IV fluid clinics available. Um, and I can tell you just different markets are different. Um, so there, some of these have infusion centers that they can send them to. Some have uh, the ability to do so in their office. And then uh, in some areas, they actually are able to send out uh, nurses to the, uh, to the patient's home for fluids uh, in the Dallas market, for example, there are actually companies that uh, can be sent out to do that and give them you know, banana bags or, or whatnot for fluid hydration. Um, 
And then another consideration is making sure that they see the patient a little earlier on. They see them in one week versus a two week visit, with, which is not uncommon with a lot of folks, two to three weeks. So they get them back a little sooner. So uh, those are the considerations to look at specifically in the post-operative phase. Um, I would like to thank my partners um, who, by virtue of me being able to do these talks, they're covering me, uh, Dr. Jason Kemenick, Dr. Ken Van Sickle uh, in my practice. And I would like to, again, thank each of you uh, for allowing me to give this talk today. Uh, feel free to follow me <laughs> and I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much, Professor Rich, um, Peterson. That was very interesting. Um, I wonder who the patients, if they really feel comfortable or um, if they are just fearing higher costs um, that they may have to pay. Um, what is your, we don't have these settings in our country yet. So I'm really interested in, in your answer. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. So it's kind of your, I think your question really relies on, uh, are we, are there higher costs to say necessarily for like an inpatient versus an outpatient? Does that kind of, and for us, um, that may be a little bit true. I know that in the outpatient settings, uh, because the amount of staff required uh, and cost required, um, you know, that is, that is a consideration. If they're insured, it's typically not much different because they have a copay, for example, um, and there may be a portion of that that they pay differently. Um, if it's a cash pay, it may very well be a big difference uh, to your question. And uh, so I think that is a consideration for, for patients when they're deciding whether they want to do this uh, as an outpatient or not. Um, obviously, in our, in our environment, if patients are paying out of pocket, um, that also facilitates and gets them to the operating room a little faster. There are a little less barriers put in place um, as some of the insurances uh, require certain things that um, may delay the process. Uh. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. I had a question regarding um, your practice in particular. Are you finding that a lot of insurance payers in your area are going to outpatient mandates for surgery and um, as a result, how what percentage of your practice is now going to this ambulatory model of outpatient same day surgery? Right. Uh, so I you you raise a great point, Allison. Um, the uh, you know your insurers. Uh, I don't know how many times we get back that this is considered outpatient only. Um, and so when we're booking the patient for surgery at a hospital, we actually get a notification from the hospital that says, hey, this is an outpatient, we're not going to be paid. And, and the hospital will lose, the, you know, our inpatient facilities lose money if the inpatient surgery goes to an outpatient uh, reimbursement. And so you're very, uh, that, you know, that's a great question. Um, and so we have to be considerate. Now, they're not saying it's only, but I mean, obviously, we have to do peer to peer uh, sometimes to get that changed because, you know, I'm not going to take a person who's on Coumadin as an outpatient, even though somebody said, oh, they should be an outpatient sleeve. I'm sorry, that's not how this works um, and have to have those discussions. Um, my practice, we have not pushed as many to outpatient. Uh, we're able to work through that. But I will tell you, uh, in my environment uh, here in San Antonio, uh, the two main surgical practices that do bariatrics, 80% uh, of their sleeves are outpatients and they, they're able to get that covered. In fact, they have a surgery, uh, outpatient surgery center that is accredited by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and they, they really track, the insurance tracks that very closely as well. What are the experiences of the other um, members of tonight's meeting? Not me. <laughs> Not yet. Not doing any ambulatory mm -hmm. surgeries, but here I echo Dr. Peterson that a lot of our insurance payers here in the Pennsylvania area are moving to outpatient reimbursement. So patient stays in the hospital, but we get paid less for the same procedure. Uh, but I'm not doing any outpatient, strictly outpatient ambulatory surgeries right now. If we would uh, establish it in Germany, we would get paid much less than for inpatient procedures because there are simply no real DRGs for an outpatient or uh, reimbursements for an outpatient setting. So um, for us, it's just interesting to listen to it because it will be the, the future probably. Right. Uh, yeah, that's definitely where are our insurance is pushing. Are we, are we uh, doing it for insurer, insurance companies, hospital, or for the patient? 
Like, well, you know, Dr. Chavi, I think you raise a really good point. And I think there, there are two parts to that. I think, you know, if it can be done and the patient can go home and it's safe, I think that's a fair, you know, consideration that they, uh, that they don't have to have all of the, you know, rigmarole being in a, in a hospital, it can be more comfortable home. That having been said, I think more of the push is because of insurances that as far as saying, you, you know, you have to do this here. Um, and the problem is that the consideration for outpatient, and again, insurers consider outpatient up to a 48 hour stay in the hospital because they're observed. But the, the truth of the matter is the resources required for our patients that are in the hospital uh, are still at that higher level, even though they could go home, even if they go home the next day, they, they still had care that was at an inpatient level overnight. And, um, and that is a problem because the hospital loses significantly if it's an outpatient reimbursement. Um, one of the things we've done in our practice too, when we were stuck at the university hospital, we really were shut down with COVID for a while. Um, we went to an outpatient or a patient um, hospital at home model. And uh, we operated on the patient and then they got to go home uh, with an IV and a nurse would come and they would, they still had IV fluids running and still like, and they could be checked on and evaluated the next day. Technically they were still admitted to the hospital. So our residents would call and check on them. Um, and if they had to come back urgently, there was not a problem. There wasn't a readmission, but um, it, that's just, you know, we have to kind of have other considerations as to what to do. And you're right. We don't want to be forced by anybody to do something that we as a medical community don't believe in. All right. Is there any other questions? I feel that I think we are just maybe a, a well-meaning. We are trying to reduce the loss of the patient and uh, mention another. I'm sure the insurance companies have a different pay payment module for the daycare procedures and also. So are they the same, the, the charges uh, which the hospital or the surgeon gets it are the same, whether you discharge the patient on the same day or you discharge the patient uh, the next day? Are the insurer paying the same amount? That's actually, they don't. So, so I mean, in terms, so in terms of if it's an inpatient, Code, they're going to pay a different man, uh, different and a higher reimbursement than if it's an outpatient uh, payment, and uh, that's exempt. That's where our hospitals take the hit because they, you know, they lose a significant amount of their reimbursement um, when it's from inpatient to outpatient. Uh, even though, frankly, we're doing the exact same thing, and the patient goes home, uh, you know, within even less than 24 hours from surgery, um, they 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 can't operate at that level. They just can't maintain uh actually uh that model yeah and also another point which we have to see is that you know like the delayed diagnosis of the complication may it be leaks it may be may it be the bleeding or may it be anything else i think uh, uh is it uh, are we apprehensive that one missed complication uh, can make because we all know that these bariatric patients uh, their tolerance is very poor and they deteriorate very fast within within minutes and hours you know the things change so the uh, are we considering those issues that if the complication takes place and if the diagnosis is not made quickly as it could be made while the patient is admitted in the hospital so uh, that delay will compensate uh, for all the advantages which we are looking for? That's a great question and point as well. I mean, you know, what does one complication, how many, how many good, you know, good moving and uh, intended surgeries does one complication undo, right? Is that one complication to 100 great outpatient surgeries? I, I think you raise a very good point. And I don't know that we know the answer to that. Um, you know, the certain insurers, like I said, in our Locate in our area, Blue Cross Blue Shield's very intent on it in the outpatient surgery centers. They're, they're watching it. You know, that's one problem we have in general in our in our um, you know system in the U.S. is that when a patient has surgery, um, we don't assign an identifier to them directly and can track them from every hospital that they end up seeing, whether it be an urgent care or another ER. Um, whereas you know the insurers absolutely track it because that's their 
that's their customer. So they're able to see a little bit better. So if someone's really watching a little bit more, it may be on that level. Um, but you're right. Uh, one complication could undo everything. And um, that's really what we're trying to be careful of and mindful of. And I think a lot of us are not really wanting to move forward to that until we're really sure that we can do it as safely. But I think we have uh, seen today that we all try to minimize the complications for our patients and uh, that the well-being of our patients is um, of, of highest priority. And we have seen um, that pushing the limits has uh, different reasons why we do it, uh, be it uh, for the patients, be it uh, interest in um, developing technique, uh, be it... Uh, um, questions of reimbursement. Um, All together, they form the body that will um, develop medicine or and especially surgery uh, toward uh, better and better results. And I think we had a great evening or uh, morning or whatever. <laughs> so I enjoyed it personally. I enjoyed it very much. And I thank so much um, all the esteemed speakers and, and um, the members here. Thank you. I quite agree with you. It has been very, very interesting uh, conversation and discussion and also the presentations, which gives it a next dimension to the bariatric surgery. However, we know that bariatric surgery is one of the complex surgeries with uh, morbidity and mortality uh, and also very difficult for these patients uh, where your selection is very crucial and critical. And uh, when we are looking at this, I'm sure... Uh, the should be done by the uh, very seasoned, uh, experienced, and mature team uh, who can, you know, sort of uh, uh, be confident about their outcomes. And selection is very important, as uh, Professor Richard has said. That I need, I, I, it's quite impressive. You should not go beyond that limit. So you should try to make a very mature decision on which you are coming in, uh, which you are including in this particular group. So with that comments, I think it has been extremely interesting. I thank my moderators and my presenters. And also we are thankful to uh, Harris and Ariel and Tom for giving all of us this opportunity to be the part of IBS Symposium. So thank you very much and enjoy the evening. Over to you, uh, Ariel. Thank you. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platform. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the 5th IBC University of Oxford World Congress will be taking place September 17th through the 19th of 2024 at the University of Oxford, UK. The Congress has been awarded 18 CPD points from the Royal College of Surgeons of England and 2025 AMA PRA credit, Category 1 credits by Cinnamon. For more information, go to ibcclub.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless.